Welcome to Uncommon Core, where we explore the big ideas in crypto from first principles. This show is hosted by Su Zhu, the CEO and Chief Investment Officer of Three Arrows Capital, and me, Ha Su, a crypto researcher and writer. Welcome, Sue. Hey, guys. Together, we brought on Richard Galvin, the co-founder and CEO of Sydney-based Digital Assets Capital Management, or DACM. His fund has been a top-performing crypto venture fund in recent years and was also among the first to bet on the emergence of decentralized finance, or DeFi, on Ethereum and other blockchains. Thanks so much for coming on the show, Richard. Uh, thanks for having me, guys. I love the podcast. It's an honor to be here. You, you're actually one of the, oh, sorry to say that, you're actually one of the older people I've met. <laughs> <laughs> but that makes it even more fascinating um, to talk to you. Can you tell us a bit about your history and how you came to invest in crypto and um, start the ACM? Sure. I, um, yeah, I am a little older. I started, in, uh, I started my career in the mid-90s in, uh, in investment banking and, and spent 20 years at Goldman Sachs and JP Morgan. I uh, spent that time focused around uh, the telco, media and technology sectors mainly. So I saw, you know, the disruption of the internet and as that came and started to disintermediate communications and media and, and, and the impact that had on, on, on the clients that I used to work with. So had two key roles through that career. Uh, I, I ended up running the, um, or the co-lead, the co-head of the, the TMT advisory group at Goldman. Uh, and then I switched back to financing and, and worked at JP Morgan for, um, uh, for six years and ended up running their uh, equity capital and derivatives markets team, again, focused on sort of high growth TMT space. Uh, left banking 2016, like a lot of people found their way to crypto through a mutual contact, um, fell in love with the technology, but also fell in love with the markets um, and you know what the people had created around the trading ecosystem for this globally fungible, highly liquid token. And it kind of brought the two things that I'd worked on all my life together, which were really technology, high growth technology, uh, disruption um, and markets. You touched on some of the things that you like about crypto. You know, like in more general terms, what what is your thesis for investing in crypto? Why did you come to um, invest here, and wh where do you place it on basically the the map for yeah macro investors or investors in general? I think if um, if you're going to invest in any uh, any asset or any thematic. Um, if you can get sort of tailwinds behind you across the whole asset class, that makes your job a lot easier because you're kind of like you're sort of sailing with the wind. Um, it can make your mistakes <laughs> less brutal and it can make your wins much bigger. And, and I think when, you know, when I first came to crypto and we'll get to valuation in a minute because I thought it was outlandishly cheap when I first found it. But I think at a thematic level, it, it seemed to capture a lot of the disruption that I thought was going to come across the world over the next you know, 10 to 20 years. I think the three key categories I'd put that in is digitization and, and, and you know, the unstoppable trend I think we'll see for you know the next 20 to 30 years and we've been living through for the last 20 years is the digitization of society and the digitization of assets. And it's hard to think of any thematic that's more perfectly positioned for that than crypto. Um, decentralization, I think, is a key theme um, at a more macro level, not specifically on a technology level across society. I mean, people live their lives in a much more decentralized manner than they did 20 to 30 years ago with their social groups, with their work. And that's partly driven by digitization and probably has been accelerated to a degree with COVID as well, pushing more and more people to think about how they can work in a decentralized manner and communicate um, with groups and that um, on a decentralized basis. And I think the third thing that kind of struck me and was well aware of that coming from, I guess, uh, my previous career uh, in investment banking there was definitely a falling level of trust, I think, across society with the traditional institutions, particularly within the financial services sector. Um, and I think, you know, some of that is some of that is frustrating, particularly for someone that used to work in that sector, but it's understandable at a level as well. And I think it's undeniable there. It's undeniably there, and it's got even more so in the five years or so since I've left that um, I've left that sector. So if you wrap that together, you can think about sort of three very key trends that sort of play right into right into crypto's hands. You know, you've got the birth of a, a very new digital asset class. Um, it plays upon a theme which is pushing through society, which is decentralization, and its key disruption is amongst those traditional institutions that people are, have lost faith in, particularly since the financial crisis in the late 2000s. Um, and it, you know, it provides a solution for that lack of trust in you know, a trustless form of technology that disintermediates those institutions. 
So when you find an asset, um, an asset class where you've got those tailwinds to invest in, um, that's a pretty pretty unique opportunity. Um, I think the other thing I, I've also learned, being a bit of a you know a, 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 a student of financial markets history, is new asset classes don't come along very often. Um, and when they do come along, they're an exciting place to be. There's a lot of innovation. And there's a lot of opportunity. Um, there's a lot of opportunity across to build you know, new, new brands, new services, um, and to really sort of build an edge as an investor and to build a brand in financial services, which is not an easy thing to do when you're building like an investment business. And I think those things together uh, made it look just a, <laughs> made it an easy choice for me for the next sort of career move uh, post-investment banking. We know obviously a lot about the Occupy Wall Street movement, and basically we we know all about the people who lose their trust in the financial institutions and institutions in general. But how did you, or did you at all notice this erosion of trust while you were inside the traditional finance sector? Yeah, I think you actually see it from both angles. So. Um... There was, a diff there was a definite change within the attitude towards clients uh, that we used to work with over my career from sort of the mid-90s through to the sort of, you know, the mid-2010s. Um, there's a lot more sceptical view of the investment banking career and, and investment banks in general, uh, and I'd say a lot more combative uh, relationship between the banks and their clients um, that developed over those 20 to 30 years. Now, it's not to say it's... You know, there's a complete breakdown of trust or anything. It was just a very different relationship, I guess, than um, the one that I walked into in the in the mid '90s. I think uh, adding to that, I think the, the the level of trust within those organisations has also um, decreased over that period. I was in the banks um, with you know the increased regulation they faced, um, you know, with the ongoing fines and lawsuits and all those sorts of things. They do second guess themselves a lot more than they did when I started there. The controls and compliance become, you know, quite stifling <laughs> um, as you work through those institutions. And I think, you know, that's probably been, been you know, a societal push to make that happen, and that's understandable after what happened with the financial crisis. But it particularly changed the environment within the, within those banks, and I think they lost a lot of the innovation, a lot of the entrepreneurial spirit that they had when I joined uh, those organisations in the mid '90s and worked through them, particularly before the financial crisis. Um, and that's probably, you know, that's probably the goal of um, some of the regulation. But, you know, with someone working there, it definitely changed the attitudes or, or changed the environment in which you were working. Did people ask themselves at all if they are the bad guys? <laughs> like as stupid as that sounds, or was it more like, like increasing content against government regulation and populism? No, I think there's a realization in those banks that some things needed to change and the excesses before the financial crisis um, uh, some of them needed to be wound back. I think those institutions also faced a lot of competition, which they hadn't faced for the last 20 to 30 years as well. I mean, we saw the rise um, of, you know, the uh, you know, fast super growth um, tech companies, which became um, uh, quite competitive, at, particularly at a hiring level amongst what would be traditionally seen as the sort of graduate market that those banks played in. Um, so I think they also started to see competitive threats I hadn't seen for in a long time for top graduates. Um, you know, the top graduates out of most universities that generally, you know, the banks had had a pretty good share of getting those top graduates into their um, into their um, graduate programs, and that makes sense because they are a very good training ground. And I found that myself, and I'm I'm, I'm very pleased with the training, or, or very thankful for the training that I got working through those institutions. But They started to find a lot more competitive, I think, particularly as you saw the, you know, the, the rise of the Googles and the Facebooks and those sorts of places. It became a pretty desirable place for some of the key graduates to go. And that starts to sort of impact, I guess, some of the ways they react and some of the culture. Uh, how, how do you think people who still work in traditional finance view crypto right now from the outside? I think there's been a substantial change in the last probably 12 to six months. Um, Uh, I always found it, and, and to be honest, when I first got into got into this space, I was amazed at, and that was one of the things that excited me about it, to be honest, that the lack of engagement or the lack of knowledge that uh, my former colleagues had around this, what I had high conviction was a new asset class. 
Um, you know, the people I used to work with are, you know, some of the most financially sophisticated people in the world. Um, and, you know, at a personal level, some of their investments, you know, across extremely exotic type investments around derivatives and assets and structured products and those sorts of things. So these aren't people that have, you know, very standard, you know, share index type portfolios. These are people that are, you know, highly sophisticated investors. Um, yet I didn't know one of them that had any exposure whatsoever to crypto. <laughs> And I think part of the, you know, a small part of my excitement at the time of finding the space was that none of them were there. And it just seemed inevitable to me that investors of, with those sorts of diversified portfolios would find their way to this asset class over time. And, and they have, and I think we've seen that in particular the last six months. Um, and also just gave me more comfort, I guess, of the valuation upside as those sort of people started to approach the sector at some point in the future and apply some of the methodologies. I guess I was looking at the sector within the early days um, to what I thought was probably some of the most undervalued tech I'd ever found. I guess a question I would have as a follow-up is, how do you see it interacting as more Wall Street people come into crypto? Do you, do you think that Wall Street firms will, let's say, for instance, put customer funds into DeFi? Do you think they'll start voting in governance? Or do you see it more as the people at these firms will will look to build on DeFi? And it kind of will just... How do you see Wall Street and and DeFi interacting? I think it's a difficult one to answer, just because the, the 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 pace at which Wall Street and I guess financial services in general moves now is so encumbered. Mm. Um, you know, it, it, it traditionally hasn't been the fastest moving sector, but I think even nowadays it's even slower than it has traditionally. Um, it seems like a hard thing for them to keep up with, to be frank. And I mean, we have seen it. Um, you know, even. Even in you know, my part of the world, the ASX has been trying to build a blockchain solution now, I think, for three or four years. And yeah. they're still no closer to launching that. And if you think of the innovation that's happened in this space over the three or four years since they've been looking to build this solution, I think it just shows the mismatch between what I'd say is the traditional financial market, the traditional financial services sector and what the blockchain speed, what, what the blockchain economy is moving at. Um, and I think that's one of the things that... Um, I think we find what we find so exciting about this tech. I mean, we saw a, a great page just to put it in context. And, you know, there's a great chart we use that shows, you know, how hard it is to open a bank account in Europe, you know, how long it takes in terms of clicks and days. And I think on average, it's something I'll probably misquote it, but you'll get the, you, you'll get the, um, the quantum's kind of the idea that on average, it takes something like 30 or 40 clicks to open a bank account in the UK and takes, I think, up to eight, you know, eight days on average and can be up to 60 days. I actually tried to open a bank account a couple of days ago uh, for a company and I was turned down by the biggest German bank. They just won't do it for compliance reasons because I have in the past uh, made some of my money by playing online poker, which is completely legal in Germany. But that the banks won't touch it. It's they they won't even uh, they they won't even give a bank account to a company where I'm a shareholder because I had to deal with poker. It's, I mean, the, this, this val just validates DeFi and, um, well, just permission this blockchain technology on so many levels, in my opinion. Yeah, well, I mean, the, the equivalent bank account, although, you know, there's obviously some uh, still some way to go to make it as, I guess, user-friendly in the traditional world as, as a normal bank account. But, I mean, you're talking about seconds in terms of inter interacting and, you know, what, two or three clicks for that to happen. So I think the, I think the problem they face is just the the sheer disruption. And um, I think, you know, I'd see a similar thing play out, Sue, that we that I saw play out through the media sector while I was working and, and working in an advisory capacity there through the mid-90s to the early 2000s. Their ability to move, even at the internet's disruptive um, speed, you know, big you know, you know, traditional corporates and telcos, um, was just encumbered by the, I guess, the bureaucracy around those businesses and, and, and some of the entrenched power structures. Um, and, you know, we saw so much destruction of value from traditional media as they failed to grasp, I guess, the disintermediation power of the internet. And then by the time they realised um, the power of that, their ability to actually then adapt um, and get on the defensive in the right sort, of, right sort of way. Now, there has been some exceptions around the media space, those that have done it, but you know, by and large, it was a, a destructive a destructive outcome uh, for media companies and communication companies. Um, and I suspect we'll see a similar thing in financial services as they struggle to keep up with the speed of change and innovation here. 
you mentioned the three big tailwinds that led you to invest in crypto and see it as, as a very profitable asset class, digitization, decentralization, and the erosion of trust in, uh, in society. Um, how, how do you go about, like when you have big theses like these, which I, by the way, strongly agree with, and I would, I would add a fourth one, which is maybe just the level of demo, demographic change and just the wealth distribution between different generations. Um, then how, how do you go about thinking about replicating that thesis with a fund? Like the, the, the investable universe is so big. How do you decide what to buy on what time frames and so on? Well, well, that thesis is basically predicated on a huge disruptive wave um, that's going to move through um, based on this technology, right? And so the way we think about it is where will that disruption hit first and hit the hardest? And where will it be monetizable? Um, mm -hmm. And I think we would take a lesson from, again, <laughs> keep harping back to it, but what we saw with the internet. Um, you know, if you look today at you know, what the, you know, the initial digital revolution drove, you know, the internet's basically um, disintermediated all through supply chains, um, you know, communications, entertainment, basically there's hardly anything that's been untouched by it. That wasn't the case in the early days. Like the, the applications and the uses of internet technology that actually accrued value were relatively confined in that sort of initial wave of the technology, um, sort of through that sort of mid-90s and early 2000s period. And it really was, you know, the value accrued largely around that sort of media communications, telecommunications um, space first, and that's where the... I guess the most most disruption happened. When we looked at this technology, um, we try to find you know what would be the most disrupted <laughs> traditional markets or traditional service uh, traditional um, economies from this technology. And time and time again, we just kept coming back to you know um, finance, uh, centralized finance, financial services, however you want to portray it. To us, every time we thought about You know, what this what this technology causes in terms of disruption, where it focuses, where its best use cases or its most value accruing use cases are, time and time again, we came to um, uh, finance. And that's you know, largely why I guess you know, we're focused largely on finance orientated investments, both at a layer one type level and in, in the DeFi space as well. Do you include store of value type assets in that uh, category? Yeah, we've always been a, a big proponent um, uh, of the digital gold thesis for Bitcoin. And, and that's been, um, I guess, how we've, how we've always viewed our investment into Bitcoin as a firm, that it would take that position as, as digital gold. Um, I actually think that is a, an alpha use case for any asset. Um, I think if you could, <laughs> if an asset was a person and you could ask them what role they would want in an economy to be the store of value would probably be the first one you would choose. It's an extremely valuable place to hold when you think of the stack of value in any economy. Um, so I think, yeah, that is absolutely um, uh, a financially disruptive um, uh, position to be in. And I also think it's a hugely valuable position to hold. Um, and from my perspective, looking across all the different theses that people always had around what Bitcoin could be, um, from our perspective, the store of value was always going to be the, was our view was always going to be the alpha use case. That was going to be the most disruptive uh, and the most value accruing uh, end case for Bitcoin. And it, it's played out that way in our view. Uh, but we also think that would crowd out other use cases for Bitcoin. Um, so we, we always had a view that, um, you know, some of the attributes that you want of your store of value, robustness, um, just, you know, absolute security and certainty means that you also don't want to change it, right? You don't want it to innovate. You don't want to add new attack vectors to it. And so therefore, other potential use cases kind of get crowded out from the mix as the store of value kind of takes hold and becomes the key value driver. And I guess that's why we've always been, a, a, I guess, a portfolio investor, as we always had a view that other use cases would would, would go down, would trickle down to other other chains and other other technology solutions that weren't encumbered by that highly valuable use case um, and they'd find a place where they could offer you know, other use cases that you know, would be just as disruptive and as value creative over time as well. And how do you view um, 
I guess more broadly, application layer versus layer one versus ether um, in terms of, I mean, it's obviously a very complicated question, but um, like in general, do you think that applications will be worth a lot more than the layers that they're on uh, or vice versa? I think it's becoming even more blurred now, Sue, because you're actually seeing applications that have their own chains, right? Yes. So, yeah, particularly, you know, things like Carva and, and Terra, where you've effectively got like an application type offering that's also running its own chain. So we are seeing a, a, a much more blurred um, landscape than we probably, you know, than we had or, or we were theorizing about back when we sort of launched our firm back in 2017. We've always had a view that um, um, there would be a number of layer one solutions that would come out of this space that would be multi-trillion dollar assets. And I think we've still got that view. I think the thing that's probably changed over the last few years is we can also see multi-trillion dollar type applications that could be somewhat layer agnostic built on top of those economies as well. Um, but it is a rapidly moving, <laughs> and, and you know, I'd have to say some of the views we had back in 2017, that's some of the things that's changed just as the space has kind of grown. Um, I think for you, you've um, also knowing about how investors sometimes value assets um, and where, I guess, investment capital accrues makes me think that layer one solutions will still be, at least, at least over the medium term, a favourite investment choice for a lot of traditional capital, just because it's an easier investment decision to make. It's a, this might be an Aussie saying, but I think it's more broadly used. It's a more of a selling shovels to the miners type scenario, right? Where you can take a view on a thematic growth without, without having to take a specific view on a management's team to execute or a project's team to execute and an application to keep innovating. You can take a, I guess, an, econ an economy wide view as opposed to having, having to take a, an application specific view, which I think you know a number of investors, particularly in a new asset class, will prefer. Um, so I don't think we'll see the uh, dilution of value or some of the premiums we see in layer ones removed anytime soon, based on the fact that that'll still be the preferred investment place for a lot of uh, new investors or what I'd say is more traditional, probably less native crypto investors into the space. We did a sound check yesterday where we had a half hour conversation that I, I wish we had recorded because <laughs> it was very interesting. Um, and we talked about the role of valuation models on how investors, on how viable basically investors see a particular asset class. Isn't it also the case that layer one blockchains are much harder to value than some of the application layer that we now see? Yeah, I think they are, but I think that's a relatively new innovation and I, I think well a re relatively new change given the reworking of tokenomics and those sorts of things particularly we've seen driven out of the DeFi space um, and I think that's no surprise that's why we're seeing some of those DeFi applications become you know I think you know, Uniswap's like the eighth biggest depends how you measure it but it's you know, eighth biggest crypto asset by market cap at the moment and it's no surprise that to me that that's the case given that you can build a you know a traditional well, kind of build a traditional valuation methodology around Uniswap to get some comfort around um, what it could be worth, you know, based on a you know, number of scenarios. Um, I think I think you're right in terms of the um, uh, the the layer one value mechanisms or the way to value them is harder than it would be for a DeFi app, right? Because DeFi app tokens have basically converted themselves into something that looks a lot more like an equity typical investment. Um, there's still a lot of changes than, um, than they used to some time ago. And, you know, so that's no surprise to me. You've seen DeFi be a you know, significant re-rating as it's been that, um, you know, as it's, as it's a sector people can more comfortably invest in if they've got that traditional valuation driven approach. I still think though the thematic of the layer ones with a whole raft of applications on top of them is still a pretty compelling investment story. And I still think over time, people will treat this technology like they treat most other technology, which is not get too worried about the valuation accrual in the short term, knowing that once the technology takes hold, once it starts to add value, 
um, the owners of the technology or the investors or the original um, capital providers will get rewarded in some way. And I think we've seen that play out in DeFi to a degree as well, uh, where you've effectively started to see the tokenomics getting reworked only once they started to actually have a real value proposition and a real user base. And I think, you know, we're never in a hurry to see our projects start returning capital to us. Um, we're not even in too fast if the economic model is still somewhat hazy if we think the use case holds, because I guess we just have faith that if you can build a user base where you're, where you're adding value, it'll get worked out at some point that the providers of the capital that got that use case up and going will get some form of return. You said, you said something very interesting, which is that anything is investable, you think, if the use case holds. And um, I would like to connect that to something that Paul Graham tweeted the other day. And, and he, I think the tweet was something like he, his kid asked him uh, why we need the financial sector in general. And, and he couldn't come up with any explanation and to try to then present that as some kind of gotcha. So <laughs> um, when we look at DeFi today, it seems to be very self-referential. There's not a lot of real-world use cases. And I think most people see that as well when they look at the regular financial system. So I have a very general question for both of you. Why does the world need a financial system, a financial sector? I think um, I'll have the first stab at that. I think um, what people underplay or underrate is the, um, the importance of the cost of capital in an economy. And um, if you look across the world and the world's leading economies, you'll generally find a pretty strong correlation between the efficiency of capital that's available to entrepreneurs and businesses and the growth and the wealth that accrues in those economies. Um, and I would say that having a sophisticated financial system, you could argue gets over sophisticated and goes down the wrong paths at many times, but ultimately its purpose is to find the most efficient way to raise and use capital across the economy. And, you know, if you looked at the US economy, it's clearly the biggest pool of capital in the world. Um, on most measures, it's the most efficient um, and cheapest pool of capital, hence why so many companies like to list there and get access to that liquidity. And so it's no surprise that they've, you know, spawned some of the greatest companies the world's ever seen based off the fact of their extremely efficient capital market. So my response to that tweet would be that I see the key purpose uh, of the financial services sector, apart from the, you know, the services it provides to you know, retail mortgage holders and those sorts of things, is really to provide uh, uh, added efficiency at that capital efficiency at that capital that capital formulation layer, um, allowing companies to lower their cost of capital and be the most efficient users of capital and uh, and most efficient financiers of the growth that they're trying to reduce. Yeah, those are all good points, and I think more more broadly too. There's never been a society without finance. Then it's just a matter of how how it's organized or how it's constructed, right? Because even when in the old days when we use shells or we use things or, you know, when we use the promise of another person vouching for you when you're on the Silk Road, the old Silk Road, um, people need a way to, to represent value and to exchange it in as efficient a way as they can think of, right? And, and so... If you if you try to imagine a world without finance, like for for me having been in finance so long, like I actually don't know how you would, I don't know how you would have a supply chain. I don't know how you would be able to get a product from city A to city B. I don't I don't get how anyone would invent anything. So I think, or anything would get produced. So I kind of see finance as, as um really the uh, glue that 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 makes all that happen, uh, via systems of incentives, uh, but. I do think that Paul Graham has a point, which is that the financial sector is different from finance itself, right? The financial sector, as it were, is the collection of people that are in suits and, you know, are, are behave a certain way. And, and yes, this can obviously wear different faces over generations. And, and I, and I think we, and I think it will, uh, through crypto. Uh, but I don't think that the underlying ideas of borrowing lending, of, of trading, of, of these kinds of, of capital formation. I don't think these ideas are the things that uh, can be overtaken. I don't think there's that much new under the sun uh, in terms of those ideas. 
I think it's interesting. The um, and one of the things I see it a lot in crypto is the. Um, um, I don't think people fully grasp the value that secondary liquid markets provide across the whole uh, sort of value chain of an economy. Um, people think of trading as this one sort of spot incident of people moving assets around, and they forget that the trading is the. I wouldn't. I don't, it's probably the wrong way to portray, but it's the necessary evil of having a liquid and low cost primary market. You know, the fact that I can buy a share in a company that I've then got liquidity in means that I'm willing to pay a higher price for that share than if it wasn't liquid, right? Mm. So you can't really divorce that whole value chain of primary, you know, even from a VC level through to a, you know, a pre IPO level to then a, a secondary market um, placement or rights issue type financing, that whole value chain and People sort of forget that it's, it's all inter- intertwined to basically producing the lowest cost of capital, in my view, um, to those users of capital, which is generally corporations or entrepreneurs. And if you take one piece out of it, so if you take the trading piece out of it and you reduce liquidity, the flow on impacts through that, through you know that primary capital part, like if I'm a VC investor and I can't get liquidity in the future, then clearly I'm going to ask for a bigger return when I make that investment, right? If my, my path to liquidity is longer, less certain, or takes, you know, is more unknown, then clearly I'm going to have a higher hurdle rate when I invest. But if my path to liquidity is to, you know, a very liquid share market or a very liquid crypto market or whatever it may be, clearly I'll lower my return threshold. I'll lower my cost of capital. And in a way, um, that allows entrepreneurs to also make um, more returns for their investments because, you know, they have to dilute less. Um, to investors like ourselves. Fantastic. Yeah. I never heard it expressed that way, but yeah, thinking about secondary markets, I mean, yeah, on the one hand, that's a necessary evil where you then get sort of trading and arbitrage and whatnot. But on the other hand, it as, as it lowering the cost of capital to invest in the primary markets, that makes so much sense. And the way that I, the reason that I asked this is if we look at DeFi today and we and like as investors, we need to build some confidence about bets that we can make, uh, use cases that will hold for a decade or longer, right? Um, So how do you think that DeFi actually improves on what we just talked about? Um, I think accessibility, um, I think, and um, you guys did a great... um, You guys did a great podcast after the GameStop incident about some of the barriers or some of the, um, the the layers of value within the traditional markets um, and how, you know, it's, it's harder to break down some of those barriers for smaller investors or they start at a disadvantage based on the market structure. Um, I think that's one of the key advantages that DeFi has in terms of opening up um, a system that's become more and more closed as time has gone by. Um, I think the concept, and, and, and to be honest, you know, I see this a lot in crypto, people underestimate the revolutionary nature of what's happening in DeFi. Um, and I think I've probably got a, a fortunate position of having lived both sides of the of the markets and, and lived very, you know, the, in, in the detail of the traditional markets and investment banks and how they work and how they make money and then see how disruptive what DeFi is creating to that value chain that the investment banks have had, you know, or investment banks and hedge funds and large institutional plays in those markets have had for um, had for decades now. I mean, the concept of anyone being able to provide liquidity into a market and earn a good return for providing that liquidity, be it, and putting current Ethereum fees to one side, but be it, you know, from $100 up to $10 million um, is such a revolutionary concept compared to what happens in traditional markets now where you've got a small club of key liquidity providers and everyone else is just trading at a disadvantage to them with imperfect information. And the value accrues to that small club of liquidity providers. Whereas in DeFi, if I provide ten dollars to Uniswap or a billion dollars to Uniswap, my percent my percentage return of the pool um, is exactly the same, um, and the return I get on my capital is exactly the same. Um, that's incredibly revolutionary concept um, and extremely disruptive. Um, that just opens the playing field as to who can play um, and who can get a return on their capital. Um, that has really been uh, sort of, I guess, ring fenced to a very elite group of corporates and and investors to date and more so lately. 
Also, I've heard a, a lot that when you're one of the super rich, then you have way more possibilities to to basically rehypothecate uh, your own collateral, if you if you will, right? So you can invest in a hedge fund, and then you can take your shares in a hedge fund and use it to collateralize something else. Um, what do you think about democratizing this particular use case? Yeah, I think that's probably why we get so excited about um, when we step back from when we step below that sort of those macro theses as I spoke about about you know the the tailwinds around you know decentralization, digitization, and the like. Some of the other things we get really excited about as you start to step into a more specific um, crypto element to it is you know composable yield and what composability brings to the table. Mm-hmm. Um, again, um, you know the concept of composability is so foreign to anything you'd see for a typical investor um, into traditional markets. And I think to your point, what it does, it gets, gives the power of capital efficiency um, to a smaller investor that's just not there today. And to be honest, you're basically re- replicating, you know, I guess the, probably the closest model to it, and I'd be interested in Sue's view, but the closest model to it today is that of a prime broker who basically provides, you know, um, whole of portfolio services um, you know, to you know, elite, super large hedge funds, um, and allows them to have a material capital advantage against um, a smaller investor into a market who doesn't get the chance to basically rehypothecate their capital or lever against you know existing positions. So the concept in DeFi of being able to provide liquidity into into one platform and then take that liquidity and effectively use it as collateral for another use case where I'm also earning a return um, and start to get those kind of you know, elite capital efficiency type metrics that you know, the world's leading hedge funds have enjoyed for some time. But to do it on a, you know, a small investor retail level is a, pretty disruptive, is a pretty disruptive outcome. And I guess something we got the most excited about when we started to find DeFi. And when you look across our portfolio, um, we think the people that provide those, compos- those composable yield opportunities we think they'll be some of the leading platforms that come out of this DeFi revolution as capital starts to accrue to those sorts of use cases and they start to be the ones that acquire scale, I think probably the fastest. Maybe just to think about like the like the recent run in Nifties, I think is interesting as well, uh, just to tie in with the idea that financialization does seem to be uh, make something more useful and make it more, li- like it gives it liveness, right? So if you think about baseball cards or basketball cards they they originally weren't really meant to be collected uh as a store of value or as a bet on collectability it was really you you saw the player stats right like you wanted to know how many points he scored and people bought these things and it was like informational and then over time as the sport became more popular people thought these are cool because you know not that many people managed to keep theirs in good condition or whatever but then it's still really just sitting in your house somewhere like you know and you and you have to send it in to get it rated and you can't borrow against it, right? Like no one is going to do that for you. So you kind of see that like with the financialization, like now people can put out content and then they can, you know, do a lot of this like peer-to-peer finance using creation, right? The the artistic creation uh, or or any other kind of creation. And, and so I think that like Richard said, a lot of the existing financial system is really intended for very wealthy people to do these kinds of things. And these things exist well for them. So, you know, people can do very fancy foundations to split up their inheritance in cool ways and do tax arbitrage and <laughs> things like that. Or like, you know, put their art in a certain way that they never have to pay tax for 25 years. Uh, so, but, um, you know, you're kind of seeing democratization of all these kinds of things where because the cost of each transaction is going lower because the because there's a network effect to information. Uh, whereas, you know, like in the traditional world, if you want to set up a certain legal entity, like you might have to pay some lawyer 50K, 100K to set it up and it's just boilerplate, it's just copy paste, but there's no network effect of information. The, the same thing gets created again and again and again, uh, which is, you know, the opposite of innovation, right? It's kind of stifling. Uh, so I think from that lens, from, from, from seeing how nifties have grown and, you know, how like top shots are now, a lot of them are worth more than like very well collected basketball cards, uh, for many years. Like it does appear that the market gives a big premium to liveness, uh, and and it gives a big premium to being able to do stuff. 
uh, for individuals. So I think you're already seeing the democratization and it's only going to be, it's, I think it's going to be bigger than people realize uh, or anyone can even imagine uh, because it's, it's, we haven't really seen this before in, in human history. How would you say compared to traditional finance, DeFi affects the, the cost of trust? As someone who's not in that system, it's really difficult for me to, to say, so how many transactions are actually prevented in the traditional finance space because trust is too expensive to establish or even impossible in some cases? I think it's um, um, the information asymmetry in the traditional finance would be quite staggering to a lot of people that haven't worked in it before. Um, just the amount of information within the um, you know within the large you know investment banks and trading firms around the world um, across multiple layers in terms of access, um, but even particularly down to you know um, uh, information around you know order flows and those sorts of things um, that just uh, you know tightly kept secrets that you know only the most senior people with the investment bank see and traders within the bank see and, and, and the information asymmetry that um, they have, you know, those, I guess those two parties, uh, you know, sort of larger investors and, and, inst and um, investment banks have given their, I guess, status within the traditional financial system. If you look at DeFi, everyone can see everyone's order, right? <laughs> I can see, I can, uh, you know, you can track wallets, you can see every transaction flow, You've basically broken. You've basically broken down um, a lot of the information asymmetry um, that has been, I guess, created a lot of the barriers within traditional markets, um, and that's how you know, a lot of the values cut up is between who has that informational um, advantage over who doesn't. And I guess you know that was one of the interesting things you guys covered when you went through you know the game plop situation. And I thought that was you know really valuable insight to a lot of people outside of the traditional markets. So. To see DeFi disrupting that um, and you know, breaking that value out into a very democratized level um, and distributing that value across the whole ecosystem, as opposed to just a, you know, a peer group or a very small group of people that have much better information over everyone else, I think is a pretty exciting thing to see. If DeFi breaks up these walls where value, quote unquote, sticks in traditional finance, then where do you think DeFi protocols can actually build their modes and retain that value into the future? Um, I think um, this comes back to, I think we're starting to see in DeFi, similar to what we'd see in um, traditional blockchains, that um, there is a there is a moat around, <laughs> around, and I mean, these timeframes are so small, <laughs> it seems a bit, a bit weird saying it, but there is a moat around um, experience and longevity. And I mean, we are still only talking about platforms that are in many cases less than a year old, but you know, a platform that's survived or has innovated or um, has a longer track record than another, I think we'll start to see the benefits of that accrue more over time as well. Um, and it just stands to reason that a platform that's you know, seen, billions of, seen, seen billions of dollars trade through it um, consistently over a long period of time and has been able to, hand that, uh, been able to handle that um, uh, you know, without sizable hacks or, you know, maintain um, a solid platform, we'll be able to um, offer, we'll only have to offer investors a lower return than a new platform that's doing the same thing. So you start to get into that sort of cost of capital advantage topic that we spoke about earlier. Um, and you start to build a moat around, you know, the reliable platforms that have a stronger track record. We'll start to get access to capital, be it liquidity at a lower rate than a newer platform. Um, and that'll give them a, a moat to basically protect them against newer platforms. And then that just puts the onus on the newer platform to be more innovative and more value additive to make up for the higher cost of capital that it's going to have to pay. That doesn't mean that moat's uh, completely defensible and you know, it never is if you could look across any technology or any sector. Um, but I think that's the first one we're starting to see accrue to some of the DeFi, um, some of the bigger DeFi apps. Um, and it doesn't mean people won't attack them and, you know, you see things like Sushi Swap and those sorts of, you know, really, you know, innovative <laughs> um, takes on competition that you'd never see in traditional markets to sort of test these theses out. But I think that's probably the first one that comes to mind in DeFi, the longevity and the trust.
based on this thesis that you have, would you say then that money markets and exchanges are the primary investment cases for now inside DeFi? I think they're the most. I think they're the most obvious, and I think they're the most disruptive. And uh, and you know that is when you know, as I said to you, when we when we looked back at to the disruption that the internet caused, and trying to find those sort of three or four sort of key industries or use cases that would get disrupted the most, and where value would accrue to the to the disruptor. Um, um, Dexes and money markets are a pretty obvious one, and um, you know it's no surprise that's where we've invested a lot of our capital. Just because we think that's you know that, that's a you know, highly disruptive use case, and, and it's a use case where you can see a clear path to value. Now, it doesn't mean this technology is not going to disrupt whole sorts of other industries and sectors and things like supply chain and NFT and art and all those sorts of things. Um, that'll come in time. Um, just you know, the the path to value there is probably more opaque now than it particularly is in the DeFi space. Um, and I think yeah, you know, I think that'll come. It's just for us, um, and that's why we're focused on this sort of financial set, this financial disruption first. We just think that's kind of the, the killer use case number one for this technology. How do you think about valuing these DeFi protocols, and um, and how much does it matter, like how you would value them versus how how much you think everyone else is going to value them? <laughs> It's a um, look. There are some similarities to traditional assets, and then there's a lot of differences. I think one of the things that got us most excited about investing in DeFi um, was the fact that you could attempt traditional valuation methodology on mm. some of these tokens, um, and I think that does a number of things. That opens up a whole new world of potential investors into the space. Um, if you look through all markets, the pool of speculative capital is a lot smaller than the pool of fundamental driven capital. Um, and it's just go, it just stands to reason as you go through the risk curve, um, that's what happens, you know, as you get lower risk, usually you get, you know, bigger pools of capital. Um, with DeFi tokens, uh, with the DeFi business models and the economics we started to see um, coming through there, it, it became clear to us that um, you would start to see models where you could build a traditional type DCF type approach and you could start to build multiples, you know, comparable multiples across different platforms to start to form a relative view on value. Um, and when you have that, that opens up a whole new world of, I guess, more fundamental driven investors that can get comfortable with buying those assets. And I think we're starting to see that and we see that in our discussions, you know, with our LPs and with, you know, particularly with some of my old peers in traditional finance, when I run them through these DeFi protocols um, or DeFi applications, it's you know they get really they get super excited about the ability to use or sort of use the methodologies that they've learned for the last twenty or thirty years to try and analyze these investments. Um, and to be honest, you know when when we started to use that methodology and we've started you know we've tried to use that since day one, um, and it's you know with some success and it's but it's it's, it's been difficult at times. It comes out pretty favorably when we compare it to most other technology, in particular given, I guess, the re-rating we've seen in technology over the last three or four years as well. Um, so it's always been our view that when you started to apply those methodologies, this technology would stand out as cheap um, or undervalued. And the more people that applied that, we'd start to see a re-rating. And I think we've probably seen that play out through DeFi. I think the other thing that you shouldn't underestimate is um, when you hold a when you hold an asset that you have a fundamental view on value, it's much easier to hold that asset through volatility. Um, and it's much easier to hold that asset, particularly in a bear market or a downturn. And I think that's <laughs> that partly goes to the psychology of our firm. If we build a thesis around value um, and the market sells off 30 or 40%, like crypto markets do, it's a lot easier to hold a token that the valuation still stays the same, right? If the usage metrics or the revenue outlook's the same, but the market's off 30 or 40%, it gives you a lot more conviction to sort of ride out those downturns. If you're holding something that's much more speculative in nature, it's a lot easier to get worried out of, out of it in a down market. So, you know, it's partly a, maybe that's just a personal style type approach to investing, but we find it much easier in volatile markets like this to build a fundamental view of value and help that help help that give us conviction through that volatility you said when the when the DeFi market turns down 30 to 40 percent and the, the valuation stays the same so um how do you think about reflexivity in DeFi? because I, I feel like we see this a lot right 
the value of a particular token goes up, the value of its liquidity mining reward goes up, it attracts more TVL, the valuation goes up. And so you have this kind of flywheel that makes everything more valuable on the way up, but then also make it crash way harder on the way down. Yeah, I think it can be overplayed a little bit because I think the the, the quantum of capital or the, the quantum of, I guess, um, incremental buyer or seller in up or down ticks in crypto can often make those sort of inflationary impacts somewhat negligible. Um, you know, we've seen, um, uh, you know, we've seen, I think, you know, for example, Solana is probably a decent example. You know, it's gone through a vesting of you know, 90% plus through January. So you've had a huge uptick in liquidity in the token, yet it's risen over that period from what, $1.50 to like $12, $12 or $13. So I think the, I think the, 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 um, the concept in crypto that sometimes that reflexivity driven by price or driven by liquidity upticks or vesting or those sorts of things, I think can be overplayed a little bit. Like it's not something to be completely disregarded, but to me, the incremental buyer on a uptick or a downtick outweighs any of the, I guess, the impact that um, some of those metrics or some of those supply changes will have on, uh, on how a token trades or a coin trades. I think also that we're, because we're still very early in the cycle, there's this, Big benefit to zooming out, like you said, which is to compare it with tech, big tech, listed tech in in the real world, where people are comfortable paying quite high multiples on you know a sector of a sector, uh, an app of an app, uh, and and so I think I think once once people across the world have have said now crypto is a viable asset class, you know there there is massive disruption happening here and massive waves of innovation, then all of a sudden everything looks cheap actually, because, you know, where else can you get 10%, 15% dividend yields, you know, cash flow yields on something that's growing at 50% a month, right? Or 30% a month. Uh, that's unheard of in, in the traditional space at this point, but yet you see all sorts of examples of this in DeFi. Uh, and, and so I think, and, and in crypto more broadly, to be honest. And, and, and I think that that, that's kind of, the, because we've had the de-risking of crypto, now we have the re-rating, where now people say, given that this could one day be the workflow of of you know these processes, these kinds of activities, then the price is wrong, right? And and you know Paul Tudor Jones said that for 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 you know if Bitcoin is anywhere near digital gold, then the price is wrong because. Uh, you know, it can already be as much as gold, and then probably be much higher because gold itself is, is so is so uh, constrained. And now with DeFi, people are saying, well, if this is the way people trade, if if you know users are going to put their assets not in these brokerages that get their shares lent out, but instead in these AMM pools where they get paid uh, to to hold similar assets. Um, yeah, I mean, I've I've seen a lot of natives get shaken out this year, the, the past 12 months, be, because of this fear of the next dump, right? The fear of the next cycle break. And so I just uh, sometimes need, need to remind myself and sort of the people that we invest with too, that like, this is the time to, 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 to actually see a play through. And, and, uh, and I think that if it plays through anywhere near the hype, then everything now is still very undervalued. But if it, does play through much more than than the hype, which historically you, I mean, like you mentioned with the internet, just being absolutely pervasive. People first thought it was like a TMT uh, concept, then they thought it was going to be like a consumer concept, and then people realized, wait a second, like there's now mobile, there's now smartphones, and now like everyone's like, there's no such thing as e-commerce, it's just commerce. There's no such thing as, you know, e. Like, there's no e needed anymore. It's just the thing itself, and like for me, I, I. I try to challenge myself every day to like think about what would it look like, you know, in that kind of scenario. And and so I think I think that the fundamental pull of investors coming in from the cash flow is inextricably tied to the to the fact that we are in the usage part of the cycle. We are in the building and using part. Yeah, I think it's. I, I think you're exactly right. It is a, that sort of. I, I mean, we use the phrase. You know, we've gone from that concept to adoption cycle in crypto. Um, and I think, you know, to your point, the 
if you take out the zero as the if you take out the zero as a downside case, you get a very different return profile. Like I don't think well, there might be some freaks out there, but I don't think anyone really thinks this stuff is going away now. And I don't think that well, that wasn't the case back in kind of late 2018, 2019. And so it's no surprise to us that you've also seen you know, a raft of uh, investment on you know the periphery services to this space as that sort of zero use case went out. Um, and you could see like, you know, traditional firms starting to get their head around, well, you know, I can now go through the compliance headache of launching a crypto trading desk because I know it's still going to be here in five years time. Whereas I think the mindset for those guys back in sort of late 2018 is, you know, why would I bother taking the political pain of pushing a crypto desk through compliance when, you know, that whole thing might, you know, fizzle out in a year's time. And I think we've taken that case off the table. Um, and I think the thing that gets me most excited, and it's something we've been speaking about for years with our investors, and it's so nice to actually have the results um, to show them now, is that you know, the users will come and start to use this technology. So all those concepts that everyone was talking about in 2017, you know, a lot of them didn't play out, and that's the same in any tech market, but, geez, a lot of them really are playing out. And we are starting to see just such staggering levels of growth. I mean, that's probably something, again, that crypto people underestimate, uh, underrate because we're just so close to it and we just sort of live it as a sort of native asset class. But you just don't see growth like this really in any other market. Like, you know, 100%, 300%, 400% month-on-month growth <laughs> in users at scale. I mean, it's just staggering amounts of growth in a, in a world where growth is really hard to find across any asset. And I think that's why we formed that view and we remain with conviction that this is the cheapest tech in the world. And as it becomes more accessible to traditional investors, as you start to see more cash flow driven type returns and more metrics that they can use and put into their traditional models, it just becomes obvious to them how cheap it is. And you know, we'll see that re-rating that we've started to see already. For some of the benefits um, of DeFi that we discussed, it arguably needs to be able to reach a bigger audience. Whereas in, in practice, we are already running against the walls of Ethereum so how do you see, how do you think about the execution risk um, to get to the necessary scale on the layer ones to to support this this kind of DeFi growth? Because you do underwrite that risk, right, when you invest in DeFi. Yeah, I think, um, again, stepping back to another internet analogy, I, I think we're kind of coming out of that sort of dial-up phase into that sort of broadband phase, right? So if I think back to the, sort of, again, showing my age here, <laughs> if I think back to the early 90s and the mid-90s when, um, you know, there was internet cafes and people would go down to a cafe to log on through a dial-up, you know, through a dial-up service to look at this thing called the internet. Um, they did that not because it was adding any efficiency or adding any value. They did that because they wanted to sort of check out a new technology, be part of it and see what it did. And, you know, basically back at that stage, everything you could do on the internet was less efficient than you could do it in the real world um, or using traditional channels. But people were like, you know, it was much easier to read a paper than it was to sit there for half an hour and download some form of page that would give you the news. But people did it because they kind of had conviction about the technology or they were involved in it and they wanted to push it forward. I think in crypto, we're at a similar stage where we're coming out of that, where, you know, particularly the early days of DeFi and we're getting further down there now, particularly the early days, you really needed to be dedicated to it to do it. <laughs> you needed to, you know, you needed to have a, a passion for it or have some some outside interest as opposed to just using the service for what it was to actually persist with it and use it. And I think what we're starting to see in DeFi, and this is really encouraging, a lot of the user interfaces and a lot of the, the technology is becoming, you know, is, is leaping forward at a pretty rapid rate. And I think where we get excited and when we're investing now, we think about well, what is that next leg? We, how will we? How will the technology simplify itself um, and improve the the user experience to make it accessible to that less passionate user? I guess the person that just wants to use it for what it is, as opposed to wants to be part of using some form of blockchain technology, right? Um, and I think when we look across our portfolio as well, there's some of the investments we've made at some of the people that are. Like looking to add efficiency through that sort of stack to make it easier for the for the new users, to make it um, easier for the developers to get to market faster and focus on what they're good at, which is building user interfaces and coming up with with new ways to innovate and disrupt. Um, 
And so we're starting to see a surge of activity sort of below that sort of user level, which I think you'll start to see at a user level as, as you know, as, as developers get to focus more on the stuff they should be focusing on with their users and making it easier for them um, as they sort of, you know, can more, I guess, right words, almost outsource or, or just plug into, you know, um, services that traditionally they've had to build themselves and waste capital and a waste time on building. Um, you know, I mean, the graph is a good example of that, right? Like you've basically got um, an incredible middleware layer of the whole of the DeFi ecosystem um, that any new app builder can, can, can plug straight into and save themselves an incredible amount of time um, and get a more efficient service and can save their capital for where it matters, which is on their user interface and on their product development as opposed to on that sort of infrastructure layer, which is not really going to add any real differentiation to them when they come into the marketplace. So things like that, we get pretty excited about investing alongside with DeFi. Nassim Taleb said the other day that um, unlike crypto, oh, he said crypto can't be compared to the internet because the internet was useful from day one. Um, do you think he romanticizes basically the history of the internet? Yeah, I think he's very much romanticizing. As someone who was using the internet, and I wasn't even using it like super early, it wasn't that usable at all. <laughs> it was slow. It was frustrating. Uh, you know, dial-up modems were extremely uh, unreliable. They went offline all the time. Mm. They froze all the time. Um, to even have the most simple of information presented to you took an inordinate amount of time. Um, and as I said, you know, as I said earlier, if you didn't have some external um, desire to push forward with it, it wasn't just the user experience that you were doing it for. Um, you know, in those early days of using the internet, there was no way that it was more, you know, it was easier to read something online than it would have been to find it in a traditional source. I mean, you could see the promise of it, and it was kind of obvious to a lot of people at the time. I um, mean, you could see it could get there, but no, it was no way it was usable from day one. Richard, thank you so much for taking the time today, coming on the show. Um, we are both huge fans of you. So it was a pleasure talking to you. Thanks for having me, guys. Uh, keep yeah. up the good work. Your podcast is, uh, is by far the best in the industry. So uh, it's a pleasure to be involved. I look forward to all the future episodes as well. All right. Thanks for coming on. Cheers. Thanks, guys.